Sal Huete, and welcome to Weekly Roman History. This is a series of videos specifically aimed at Latin students and other entry-level classicists. My aim is to provide a brief overview of Roman history for background purposes, in such a way that one could realistically watch one video per week and get the full story in a single school year. It is a story, and I'm going to try to tell it as a story without getting too far into the weeds. As such, I will certainly gloss over some important details. I will also be passing along a lot of Roman legends and myths that modern historians tend to dismiss as fiction. I will try to note when I'm doing that, but always remember, I'm giving you the Romans' version of their history, not necessarily the factual truth. I do invite correction. If I pass along any wrong information or leave anything out that you think is vital, please use the comments to let me know. Do keep it civil down there. These videos are aimed at students. Be kind and appropriate in your comments. Throughout the series, I will also do my best to warn you about sensitive content at the outset and tag it with a title. This first video will contain a brief depiction of a suicide. I will place this title on the screen when that portion begins and take it away when it ends. That way you know which portion to skip, mute, or plug your ears for. If I ever don't tag something as sensitive to content that I should have, that's another thing to let me know in the comments. Now let's get to it. For our first weekly dose of Roman history, I'll be dipping fully into the realm of legend, because the Romans linked their origins to a story you have certainly heard of, the Trojan War. Oh look, it's a primary source quote. I plan on incorporating at least one quote from a Roman source into each video, preferably ones that will benefit the students to recognize. This first one is the opening line of the Aeneid by the great poet Virgil, Arma virumque cano, I sing of arms and a man. In the Aeneid, written in the late 1st century BCE, Virgil sets down the founding legend of Rome. He was ordered by Augustus, the first emperor, to become the Roman Homer and create an epic poem that would bring Romans together under a common cause after decades of civil war, much as Homer was credited with creating a unified Hellenic or Greek identity out of a disparate group of city-states. Sidebar. Homer probably wasn't a real person, and his works were created by generations of anonymous poets working in the oral tradition. But it's much easier to just call him Homer and pretend the Iliad and the Odyssey have a single author, even when we know it's not true. In any case, Homer fostered the creation of a Hellenic identity by reminding the Greeks of a moment of unity in their past when they came together to fight the Trojan War. In need of a unifying patriotic subject, Virgil returns to the very same event. When Virgil says, I sing of arms, he's referring partially to the Trojan War, though also to another war that I'll get to later. When he sings of a man, he's talking about Aeneas, the last surviving Trojan hero. Troy was a city on the northwestern coast of modern-day Turkey, which flourished in the late Bronze Age. Archaeologists have found a lot of cities on Troy's site built on top of each other, so it has a lot of history. Modern historians place the fall of Troy that I'm about to talk about around 1180 BCE, which jives pretty well with the timeline used by the ancient Greeks and Romans. Troy is most well attested in the Greek myths of the Trojan War. I don't want to get into the whole story. If you don't know it, you should definitely look it up. But the basics are that the Greeks besieged the walled city of Troy for ten years, ostensibly to retrieve Helen, the beautiful wife of the Spartan king Menelaus, stolen by the Trojan prince Paris. Paris is sort of an anti-hero on the Trojan side. The main Trojan hero is his brother Hector, who was famously killed by Achilles in the Iliad. But there's another Trojan hero in the Iliad. Aeneas, son of the mortal Anchises and the goddess of love Aphrodite, or Venus once we switch to the Aeneid. He's a very minor character in the Iliad, one of a sea of Trojan and Greek names. His main role is getting saved from almost dying in battle by various gods, because he is not destined to die in the war. He is descended from Dardanos, a favorite of Zeus, and it is only the line of Priam that is destined to die out. The Romans believed that Aeneas traveled to Italy and founded a city, and that the Romans were his descendants. The story I'm about to tell you is derived heavily from Virgil's Aeneid, a poem which does a lot of retelling of myths that were well known already in Virgil's time, and a lot of inventing of new stuff from Virgil's imagination, which is the way of ancient epic poetry. In any case, the Aeneid is the version that comes down to us, and the version that was most influential from the 1st century BCE all the way through the Renaissance and into the modern day. As you probably know if you even heard of the Trojan War, the fall of Troy came with the trick of the Trojan horse. Greeks hide in a big wooden horse and pretend they left it behind as an offering to Minerva, Trojans bring it inside to get her favor, Greeks sneak out in the middle of the night and destroy the city. As the city burns around him, Aeneas first tries to fight back. Then, after numerous divine interventions, finally gets the message that it's a lost cause and gathers up his family to leave. He leaves the city carrying on his shoulder the, his elderly father Anchises, who is himself carrying the gods of Troy, and leading his son Ascanius, or Eulus, by the hand. There's some gloriously heavy-handed symbolism here. Aeneas carries his father, 
the past, who is himself literally carrying the traditions of his homeland, and leads his son, the future, by the hand. He is leading both the past and the future of Troy into Italy, and the Romans believed that some of the sacred relics in their temples were the very objects carried from Troy by Aeneas and Anchises. Aeneas manages to help a large group of refugees escape Troy with him, and he sets sail in a bunch of ships with a crowd of followers. One person he notably loses is his wife, Creusa. He notices that she was isn't with him anymore, and runs back into the burning city, only to meet her ghost. She has been killed by Greeks, and urges him to move on and save the others. So Aeneas and his refugees escape, and what follows is a mini odyssey. He wanders over the whole Mediterranean, often driven off course by the goddess Juno. Juno hates Troy because of the whole apple of discord thing, look it up if you don't know what I mean, and has a special hatred for Aeneas. She has a new city she loves, Carthage, and the fates say that the descendants of Aeneas will someday destroy Carthage. The difference between Aeneas and Odysseus is that Odysseus is trying to get back home, and Aeneas is trying to find a place to make a new home. There are tons of prophecies about where that new home should be, and they're very coy, so he has to work hard to figure out where the gods want him to go. Sidebar about the prophecies, because there are a ton of them. It's the ghost of Hector who first tells Aeneas to go found a new home, and Creusa who tells him to go west. Apollo tells him to seek his ancient mother, meaning his mother land, because of course Aeneas' mother is Venus. Aeneas first thinks he means Crete, but later learns it's Italy. Then he is told that when the Trojans arrive at their new home, they'll be so hungry they'll eat their tables. This is a fun one, because when they get to Italy, they eat food on bread plates and then eat the plates, and Ascanius points out that they just fulfilled the prophecy. This leads some to assert that Aeneas invented pizza, which is dumb, but also great. He's also supposed to see a white sow suckling 30 young, which I'll explicate later. The Cumaean Sibyl warns him of a second Trojan War, a second Troy, a second Achilles. After his father Anchises dies, Aeneas visits him in the underworld, where Anchises tells him about all the future Romans and cautions against civil war. Virgil also foreshadows Rome with a fantastically decorated shield Venus gives Aeneas, which has the whole of Roman history depicted on it. So, after wandering for six years, Aeneas is heading for Italy when Juno sends a storm that blows him off course all the way to Carthage. Carthage is in northern Africa, and in Virgil's legend is only now being built. Its founder is Queen Dido, a daughter of the king of Tyre, a Phoenician civilization in modern-day Lebanon. Her brother Pygmalion murdered her husband Sicius, and would have murdered her too, but she escaped with great riches and a lot of people to Africa, where she has begged a bit of land to found a new city for her people. This is Carthage, the new city Juno is fond of, that the fates say Aeneas' descendants will someday destroy. Aeneas and his Trojans land there, and are welcomed in. Dido is concerned with the threat that her brother Pygmalion still poses, and a bunch of renowned warriors staying in her city can only help. Venus sees Aeneas getting cozy in Carthage, and figures Juno is up to some trick. So she plays a trick of her own, and sends Cupid down, disguised as Ascanius, to make Dido fall in love with Aeneas. Now Dido is conflicted. She has sworn never to remarry after the death of Sicius, but is now hopelessly in love with Aeneas. Her sister Anna says to go for it. So when a storm ruins a hunting expedition and Dido and Aeneas wind up hiding in the same cave, Juno performs a farcical wedding ceremony, and they come out claiming to be husband and wife. Juno too sees an advantage in this match. If Aeneas becomes Carthaginian, he will never found a civilization to destroy Carthage. But Jupiter sees Aeneas working to help Dido build her city, and sends Mercury down to remind him of his real destiny. Aeneas starts packing right away. Throughout the Aeneid, Aeneas is pushed around by the gods without a lot of free will. Dido hears he's leaving and begs him not to, but Aeneas tells her that they were never really married. Ouch. And that the gods say he has to go. As Aeneas sails away, Dido tricks Anna into building a funeral pyre and kills herself on it, hoping that the bad omens of her death will follow Aeneas. She also curses her descendants to hate the descendants of Aeneas forever. The historicity of the entire Dido episode is off, even by the Aeneid standards. Dido, if she was real, probably lived like 300 years after Aeneas, if he was real. Virgil seems to have concocted the meeting of Dido and Aeneas to prefigure the Punic Wars, the wars against Carthage that established Rome as the major Mediterranean power in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, which I will cover in a future video. Aeneas sails on to Italy and lands in the region of Latium, where he meets the Latin tribe and their king, Latinus. Real creative naming going on here. Sidebar. The Romans linked the name Latium, or Latium, with the Latin verb latere, to hide, 
They claimed that Saturn, the king of the Titans, hid in Latium for a while after losing his war with Jupiter and created a golden age there, a sort of Garden of Eden where no one had to work. It's a false etymology, but an important part of Roman culture and the origin of the Saturnalia festival. Anyway, when King Latinus of the Latins meets Aeneas, he's overjoyed. A prophecy says that his daughter, Lavinia, must marry a foreigner, and he's been waiting for a suitable foreigner to come along. Unfortunately, his wife, Amata, has not been so patient. Without Latinus's permission, she has betrothed her daughter to Turnus, king of the nearby Rutuli tribe. The Sibyl told Aeneas that he would have to wage another war over a woman, and now Aeneas's odyssey comes to an end with a mini Iliad. Aeneas and the Trojans must fight Turnus and the Rutuli over Lavinia. Along the way, Juno helps Turnus out in a bunch of sneaky ways. Aeneas secures some Italian allies, including King Evander, who entrusts Aeneas with his son Pallas. Pallas becomes sort of a surrogate son to Aeneas, which is messed up because he has a son, but whatever. Then Turnus kills Pallas in battle. Finally, the Aeneid comes to a similar end to the Iliad, with Aeneas facing off against Turnus one-on-one, -on -one, winner take all. Before Aeneas can win this battle, Juno must set aside her enmity, which Jupiter convinces her to do. Aeneas defeats Turnus handily. Turnus begs him to spare his life, and Aeneas is about to, but then he sees that Turnus is wearing Pallas's sword belt. He flies into a rage and kills Turnus. And where the Iliad ends with Achilles displaying kindness to the father of Hector, the Aeneid ends with a lack of mercy and an act of vengeance. Where the Iliad allows the aftermath of Hector's death to play out on the page, the Aeneid ends the second Aeneas buries his sword in Turnus's chest. And in fact, the verb condere, used in the first lines of the epic to talk about Aeneas founding a city, is repeated at the end with its alternate meaning of bury when Aeneas kills Turnus. The act of founding a city is inextricably linked to the violence of war and a petty act of personal revenge from a normally pious character. I bring all this up not just to flex my literary criticism muscles, though I do enjoy that, but also to point out a central theme in the Roman imagination. The story of the founding of Rome is violent, and not in the way of many modern founding stories, which, even when violent, are typically taught to the young with stories of unambiguously noble founders. Romans had some deeply ambivalent feelings about Romanness that came out in their founding myths. We'll see a similar uneasiness in the fratricide central to the Romulus and Remus myth. The rest of the story is hinted at in the Aeneid, but not played out. Aeneas marries Lavinia and founds a new city with his Trojan refugees, which he names Lavinia after his new Italian wife. It is important to note that what Aeneas founds is the race of people who will someday found Rome. He is not the founder of Rome, but rather the sire of the mixed line of Trojans and Italians who will become the Romans. Aeneas' son, who is called Ascanius about as often as Eulus, moves out to found his own city. He is a child of Aeneas' first marriage, and Aeneas is founding a dynasty to be led by the children of his third wife. So best for Eulus to be out of the way. The city Eulus founds not far away from Lavinium is called Alba Longa, and it becomes bigger and more prosperous than his father's city. Alba Longa is the meaning behind the prophecy of the white sow suckling 30 piglets. Alba is Latin for white, and the 30 piglets represent the 30 years Ascanius was on the throne after founding it. By the way, when they found the auspicious pig, Aeneas celebrated by sacrificing her and all 30 piglets. Ugh. Anyway, the next chapter of our story will be centered around this city of Ascanius, Alba Longa. I feel a little like the narrator of Tristram Shandy, who wrote several volumes of his autobiography and realized to his embarrassment that he had still not yet been born. Here we are at the end of the first video and Rome doesn't even exist yet. But that's how the story goes. I promise not to leave you hanging any longer. I will, in fact, let Rome be founded in the next video. I hope to see you then.